What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video. Today, I got a brother coming on. He's done time in the feds, done time in the Tennessee, I believe, state. But I'll let him tell you his story. He can talk. Mike, you got the mic. Tell the people who you are, where you're from, and talk a little bit about you, bro. All right. Man, uh, my name is Mike Miller. Uh, I'm from a little bit of everywhere, man. You know, this man told me where I made a dollar, that's where I'm from. So, but now I, uh, a little bit in Illinois, I, I lived there until I was about 14, moved to Tennessee, lived in Tennessee for, hell, I don't know, uh, eight, 10 years. You know, that's where I really grew up at, you know, and got my morals and values and all that shit. And, uh, and then I moved to Kansas City area in 05, and I've been here since, minus the, uh, little, vacation with club fed so how'd you end up in federal prison uh shit man trying to be cool and hip you know trying to be that guy um selling dope packing pistols you know trying to be something i wasn't i want to talk to you a little bit about you know you said packing pistols selling dope who'd you grow up with man how'd you get involved in that life well Man, I grew up in the hood, you know, I grew up around the ghetto and that that's what I was, you know, leaned to. I, I didn't have an old man. My old man, he's a piece of shit. He wasn't around, you know, and uh, left my mom to fend for me and my brother. And then I got a younger sister and, you know, mom worked her ass off, man. So she was gone a lot. You know, sometimes she had to take a job second or third shift and, you know, left us to our own devices, man. And we know how that go. I'm out there in the street, you know, I'm. I'm looking up to these guys, got a little money in their pocket, got these cool cars, got got beat in that bitch, you know, got girls all around them. And I'm like, man, I'm going to be that dude, you know? And, man, wasted a lot of years on some bullshit. Being that dude sent you to prison, right? Man, and a whole lot more. Prison was the easy part. It's all the other shit. It's the relationships I damaged along the way. That's, what, that's the hard pill to swallow. You know, hell, I'm still, even to this day, man, I'm still trying to repair, you know, relationships with, with, with my oldest three kids, you know, uh, hell, even like my family, you know, they're kind of sitting back like, okay, what's he going to do? Is he going to do the right thing? And, you know, now I got some, uh, I got my legs up under me, you know what I mean? And it's a good feeling. It is a good feeling. I'm going to talk a little bit because there are probably some single mothers watching the show, man. You know, I really... I come from a single mother household, too. My father was a drug addict. My father died getting high. But what was it like growing up in a single mother kind of family? Did you feel like you had to be the man of the house? No, nah, man. I got a brother that's a year older than me. He was kind of the man of the house. He was like the uh, the babysitter, the more mature, more responsible one. And, man, me, I was one of them guys, man. I, I, I wasn't going to ask for permission. But when it happened, I'm going to ask for forgiveness. I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to take what I got coming. And, you know, um, it is what it is. You know, I didn't beat around no bush. I didn't, I didn't, you know, shortchange nothing. And, man, my mom used to whoop my ass when she was around. There's a lot of shit I got away with because, you know, she was gone working. It ain't like my mom was out there in the streets fucking up. You know, my mom was putting in 60, 80 hours a week. Not every two weeks, a week. You know what I mean? So, you know, it is what it is. You went to prison in Tennessee, right? Yeah. Tell me a little bit why you went to prison over there. Um, same type of shit, man. I, uh, I got to end up selling drugs at a young age in Tennessee. You know, I was selling weed, cocaine, selling crack, um, and just caught up in the lifestyle and ended up, uh, some guys owe me a little bread, man. And I ran up on them. I, I ran into them actually. They was kind of, you know, just <clears throat> ducking me, ran into them. And I'm like, Hey, what's going on? They're like, man, we can go get this cash. I get in the car with them. And drive down the road, and these motherfuckers go and rob some little Mexican man, some illegal immigrant, and uh, in the projects. And I see what's going on. I get out the car and walk off down the road, and then they pull up on me about three blocks down. I said, "Come on, man, get in." So I get in. I'm like, "Man, just take me home." Needless to say, I didn't make it home. We ended up all three of us in jail for a fucking uh, aggravated robbery with a, with, a, with a weapon involved. And uh, the shitty thing is, these stupid motherfuckers, they didn't even have a real gun. They had a fucking BB gun. You know what I mean? You put my life in danger on some humbug shit. You know, I learned right then, man, don't just get in the car with anybody because you'll fuck around and get jammed off. And uh, so I ended up on a, had a robbery case. Um, 
they dropped it down to simple robbery, gave me six years in the state. Um, I was young, man. I was 20 years old when I got locked up. And from eight, from 15 to 18, I was in and out of juvenile homes, uh, wilderness camp, foster homes, uh, you know, just institutions for troubled teens. It unruly didn't want to fucking listen, you know, because I had all the answers. So turned uh, 18. I ran away so many times from them places that my juvenile judge made me a determined sentence until I was 18. So I had to stay locked up. Well, come uh, September of 97, I turned 18. I think I got it all figured out. A month later, get caught with a little weed, get a simple possession. I'm on probation. Then uh, I had actually caught a felony weed case I sold to a fucking informant. And uh, they rolled down on me to give me a uh, two years paper. You know, in Tennessee, man, you get caught with up to like 75 pounds of weed. It's only two years probation. You ain't never been in no trouble. It's a class E felony. It's the bottom of the bottom. You don't go to prison. It's just straight probation. So uh, they put me on probation. Before I'm even on probation, I catch that robbery charge. And uh, I'm fighting. I'm about to go to trial. And I ended up, man, my lawyer wanted some more money, and I didn't gave him a bunch. I got locked up on a violation of probation. My broad didn't want to act right, and uh, it just it didn't work out. So I ended up going with a public pretender, and he got me six years in the state. I get in the state, and, you know, I'm young, man. Like I said, I grew, grew up in the hood, man. I'm, you know, I'm a retired vice lord. You know, a lot of people, they're like, damn, man, you white. How you a vice lord? Man, it is what it is, you know? And, uh. We're gonna we're gonna so, get into that vice me, we're gonna get into the vice lord thing in a minute. Keep going though. Okay. So I end up uh would have been I go up for parole in like six months, they kick me down. I uh, go back up in a year, they kick me down another year. I'm about to go up for parole and uh, I'm like three months from going up for parole. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I've been incident free for a year. I just know I'm going. Stuff happened with the guys, man, and you know. I got to be that guy. I got to show, man. You know, I got a heart. I, and motherfuckers knew what it was, but still, you know, I felt like I had something to prove. And uh, I went right on up there the yard, man. Ended up getting into it, man. Beat the hell out of this one dude. In fact, they called me Jackie Chain because I jumped up and hit him like this, they said. And, uh, but needless to say, man, his partner pulls his knife out. I take it from him, man. Give it right back to him. Stab the shit out of him. And uh, police booked me. They put me on fucking max for two years for, um, Gang activity, well, it actually is STG activity, um, assault and assault tell the, the deadly weapon. Tell the people what STG is. Uh, STG is called a security threat group. That is anybody that they deem that is a group of people acting in unison to disrupt the safety and security of the institution in some way, whether it be smuggling drugs in, whether it be trying to pull one of the, 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 the female officers you know, um, any of that shit, you know, so, and, you know, in, in the feds, they got cars, in the state, they got gangs, you know, so it's all a fucking gang, man, the biggest gang we lost against, that's the fucking law enforcement, you know, but. Some people don't, some people don't understand that, so, yeah. you're in Tennessee, you're a vice lord, right? Yep, and I'm, count. I'm with the shit, I, you know, I'm young, I didn't have no kids, didn't have no responsibilities, you know, I didn't give a fuck, I was like, man, I'm flat my time. And uh, I brought that bitch to the door, man. I ended up doing five. In Tennessee, normally, man, if you do day for day, stay out of trouble, man, you could kill a six-year sentence in four years. I did it just a little over five, man, because I fucked off my time. I want to ask you, what kind of gangs did they have in that Tennessee state prison system? Because I've heard about some of them myself. Well, um, you know, the white boys, they got a uh, Aryan nation, uh, which is Christ their Christian identity. They don't... Uh, they believe some of that's the that, stuff. That's that Matt you know, Hale but, stuff, right? Huh? Matt Hale, Christian identity. Yeah, hey, speaking of Matt Hale, man, hey, he was at uh, Terre Haute with me. Sure was. He's talking about the guy that uh, was going to blow up a judge because uh, um, in Illinois. Yeah, yeah, he was there. So anyway, uh, go ahead. So that you had Harry Nation, you had Brotherhood Forever, you had a few uh, uh, TOA, which is Tribe of Aryans. Um, I think there was like two war dudes that I ran across, um, which is white area resistance. And then um, you had some Crips in Memphis, because where I was at was real close to Memphis starting out. You know, we call it the wild, wild west. You got west high and you got northeast. And uh, it's Thunderdome, the gladiator school. You know, it's 
go in there and, you know, whoever got the numbers going to run shit, but everybody get a little piece of their pie, you know? Um, so you got GDs, you got Vice Lords, you got some Bloods, you got some Crips. Um, let's see what else. Uh, and then, you know, the white boy gangs. I, and I think there was maybe two or three Latin Kings that, that I ran across in the state. So. This is what I want to ask you, right? So you're a vice lord. You're a white dude. You're a vice lord. You're in Tennessee State Prison. How do the other white dudes feel about you? Man, listen. I was watching your video the other day with the other dude. Let me tell you right now. I read people pretty decent. Man, some of them white boys, they fucking hate me. You know what I'm saying? They call me a fucking a no good nigger lover, a fucking race traitor, you know. And I don't give a fuck. I'm me. You know, I'm the same motherfucker. That's anybody that, that know me, they'll tell you. I'm the same person on the street as I am in the joint. I'm not going to change up and let another man dictate how I am, you know, because at the end of the day, man, if you ain't true to yourself, you ain't true to shit. So, uh, yes, a lot of them white boys, some of the white boys was cool with, you know, the, the, the younger, hipper ones, but like the older guys, you know, the old convicts and shit who, who have been through the, um, the shitty end of the deal, you know, for the white boys back in the day when it was real segregated. And, uh, you know, it's, some of the white dudes used to get treated, man, you know, and, some of them dudes are cool with me, but now nah, I know a lot of them hate me. You know, I know a lot of them didn't like me. I don't care. Did you feel like you had dudes smile in your face and talk about you behind your back kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, they, they white dudes and the black dudes. You know, a lot of the black dudes embraced me, though, you know, because they, they knew I was I, I was cool. And uh, that's one thing I can say. I'm, I'm, I'm happy my mom raised me, man, to be a good person. Treat people how I would like to be treated. Don't see them for the color of their skin. See them for the moral fiber of what, what they are. You know. I understand that. So now let me ask you this part, right? Like you yeah. said, some of the black dudes didn't embrace you, right? Because I've seen it myself. Mm -hmm. Did you feel uncomfortable? Go ahead. You know, uh, it was one of those things. Everybody on the compound knew who I was, and pretty much everybody knew who I rode with. You know what I'm saying? And I, I caught a violation one time, and I got into it with a dude, ended up, you know, pieced him up, and, uh, you know, I didn't just beat the hell out of him, but he disrespected me. I handled my business, and the guys got mad at me because they felt that, hey, man, hold on. We, you know, we don't do no one-on-ones. I said, man, I'm a man. You know, if I do what it would be, it would be. But I just, I'm not going to come and, you know, get permission and everything. You know, and in the state, you can kind of get away with that, man. The feds are holding on the ball game. That's just, so. That, that's, that's the point I'm getting at, right? So you're a white dude. You're in a predominantly black gang. Yeah. Do you do you feel like some of the black dudes are like, man, what the fuck is he doing, man? Like this dude ain't this dude shouldn't be a part of what we're a part of. I mean, and I had juice, you know, I, I had some status, I had some rank. And uh from you know, trying to prove myself, there was even some of the brothers, you know. I, I know there was two brothers in particular on one compound I was at that, you know, they would try to be cool, but then they try to get, you know, catch me up on dumb shit, little humbug shit, try to get me put on the wall, you know, and I'm like, man, listen, you know, and it, yeah, I've, I've experienced it on both sides, man. You know, it is what it is. Did you ever feel like because you were white and you were in a predominantly black gang, you had to prove that you had heart? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. At times, and uh, even after I put in work and put in work and put in work, and the guys are telling me, you know, like my man's, you know, Pim Shorty, you know, big guy on the travelers. He told me, he's like, bro, don't go up around that yard. That, you know, when I caught that stabbing and shit. He told me, he's like, man, you about to go home. Don't go up there. I was like, man, I don't, I don't go, I'm going to go show these dudes how to do it. Because we had some new brothers that didn't really, they were new, they were young. You know, and I felt like I'm going to show them, you know, how this shit's supposed to be. But shit. So you, you, go out, myself, you go out there to show them, you go out there to show them how it's supposed to be, and you end up serving the consequences, right? Yep. Hard head make for a soft ass. Say that again, man. I said a hard head make for a soft ass. I want you to say I want that I want you to say that twice so people could hear it. Hold on, for the ones in the back, let me tell you like this. Hey, a hard head make for a soft ass. You know, you can learn the hard way, man, you're gonna end up yeah. Hmm. It's all good. So now you end up in federal prison. You go to federal prison. What is the first federal prison that you go to? I went to USP Terre Haute. Um at the time it was an active yard. It was rocking and rolling. You know, um, I've heard all these stories. You know, I spent 14 months in a federal holdover with guys that's been in the joint. You know, there's some violators and stuff. And I'm hearing all these stories. And I'm just like, man, you know, 
ain't that bad, you know, I'm like, fuck, you know, I, I ain't scared, I ain't scared, man, I ain't gonna lie, man, you know, I'm on that bus, and uh, we left from CCA, we drive all night, we get there, and how it looks on paper is, I already knew I was going to Terre Haute, a case manager had let me know, but I didn't know if I was going to the USP or the FCI, and I figured I was going to the FCI, because I'm like, man, my points ain't that bad, you know, I'm really got no criminal history. I got one felony, you know, and then some bullshit misdemeanors. And uh, so I'm thinking, I ain't gonna, you know, I'm not going to the pen. And we get there, and first place we go is the pen. We go past the FCI, we pull up in the pen, and, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking from guard towers. I'm like, fuck, man, I ain't never seen no prison like this. Is, this, this is serious, you know, behind that wall and shit. They back up in that Sally Port, and they start rattling off names, and, you know, and dude says, da 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 da, and so and so, so and so. And uh, he says, oh, yeah, and Miller. I'm like, yeah. He said, you get off here. I'm like, all right. Because on paper, the way the, uh, the um, we call it airlift sheet would say, it would just say Terre Haute USP because the FCI used to be a USP. So there would be guys going to the FCI, but it, on paper it would say USP. But when that motherfucker called my name, you know, and I get off it and get undone and all that shit, and I go in there and, you know, you just – when you walk into that place, man, it's, it, it's a, if you don't feel kind of on edge, uneasy, um, if you feel at, at home or comfortable, you're fucked up. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, it was intimidating, very fucking intimidating. You know, and I've heard all these stories and shit and I'm like, all right, you know, this is, this is where it goes down. This is the big boy shit. Were you hoping? When you, when don't get me wrong. At the time. There was other USPs that was rocking way harder, but they, they were still getting it in there. You know, it was, it was fucking, it was going down. And, uh, and I get there and I'm just like, wow. I want people to understand this, right? So when you're on this bus and you're pulling up the USP Terre Haute, you're thinking in your mind, like, man, I hope they don't call my name. And they start calling names. You're like, damn, they ain't called me yet. And then when they do call your name, tell people what happens to you, man, how your body feels. You're like, do you, do you get that? Did you get that feeling like, damn, man, because you were man, hoping it wasn't? I, I tell you what, I, I'll equate it to um, when that goddamn judge gave me that time, man. You know, I'm just like, fuck, you know, why me, you know? And uh, so I stand up, you know, they undo my cuffs and take the little belly chain off. I was hooked up to another dude, but they unhook, unhook me from him, take the belly chain off. Still got shackles on and march me into uh, R&D. And, uh, you know, we're sitting there, you know, I already know the, the intake process. You got to get naked, you got to strip, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with all that. So then uh, we go sit in this room, you know, and they're doing this one by one. And um, SIS, you know, they, SIS, they all do their interview when you hit a compound. So they asked me about my gang affiliation. I said, listen, man, uh, I'm not going to be, I'm not on count. And they're like, are you sure? And I said, look, I'm not on count. I'm on man time. I'm just going here, chill, do my thing. Get the fuck out of here. You know, I got kids and, you know, it was a different game because prison's dangerous already. But the USP, man, is, them fucking places, they're real dangerous. And then when I get there and I know, I, you know, Terre Haute, that's where they house death row at, you know, so that that's like a maximum security, you know, and I'm thinking, I ain't that bad of a fucking person, you know, I just made some fucking wrong choices, you know, got involved in drugs, doing them, selling them. And it was, it was, it was mind blowing, man. But you know, the, the, the thing that got me was when, uh, you know, the SIS people, they, they, they do your little, uh, interview or whatever, you know, have you ever cooperated with any law enforcement? No, all that bullshit. And they said, well, look, man, if, if you have any reason to believe that, you know, you wouldn't be safe here. I don't think so. You know, I, why? He goes, well, I'm going to tell you right now, man, if there's anything fucked up in your shit, that, you know, you're better off to just go ahead and go to the shoe and refuse the yard. And I'm good, man. You know, I'm going to go out here. So I go out there and, um, you know, i tell you what, there was maybe 12 people that got off the bus with us. And I think there was six or seven of us that actually went to the yard. The rest of them went up top. It was like that when I went to Big Sandy. That was my first prison in when we're on the bus, there was like 30 something of us, man. And honestly, there was probably about 12 people that went to the compound. And even right. when you go there, they told you when you went the next day to laundry, they're like, look, they give you used clothes in Big Sandy when you first got there, at least back then. 
And they say, if you're still here in 30 days, come back. We'll give you brand new pants and shirts so you got some stuff to wear to visit. But you might not be here right. even 30 days. So that was crazy. Right. Man. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, there was one guy that got off the bus with me. He was, uh, I guess he was at CCA. He was in another pod. Fuck, man, he didn't even make it a month. You know, he was on the other end. Other, he was on the south side. I was on the north side. And he didn't even make it a month, man, after putting work in. And um, well, what, what, what really was crazy was, so we got out of, out of R&D and we walked down and they take us over to F1. Now, at the time, F1 and F2 was what they call the blue and gold program. It was a generic smoo, if you will. And um, for people who don't know, the smoo program is a special management unit. It's basically for people that are fuck ups, that are violent, that are with the gang shit, that are with stomping people out. Just really, you know, I'm not going to say just fucking all out stone cold killers. Like some of them dudes are, they've worked their way down to that. But, um, just motherfuckers that are just with the drama, with the nonsense, that are with the shit, you know? So I go into this unit and it's fucking just off the chain. There's people going everywhere. And immediately this dude I know, cause I cut a hair and I was the barber at CCA. He comes up to me. He's like, Hey, what's up, homie? And uh, I get to talking to him. I'm like, Hey, what's going on? You know, it was nice to see a familiar face amongst the whole. And, and when you walk in, everybody's looking at you, you know? you feel like a fucking piece of meat, you know, almost like, damn, you know? And uh, he's like, hey, who you riding with? You know, you with Missouri or what? And all this and that, and, you know? So he takes me to my people. I get to talking to them, and I'm like, you know, they're like, hey, check it out, homie. You got to get that work. You got to do this, this, and this. If you're fucked up, you get, here's your grace period. Go ahead and go. And uh, the next morning, um, we go out to chow because they only let us out for breakfast to go to the compound, uh, lunch, now, we had lunch, too, but dinner was served in the unit. You know, it was a semi-lockdown unit, and uh, it was fucking crazy. I ain't going to lie, man. You know, they put us in that cell that evening, like 4 o'clock, they locked us in for 4 o'clock count, and I had the whole rest of that evening, and I was just sitting there, you know, trying to take it all in, and I was just like, all right, you know, and I had a celly. He did legal work, and he was real cool, and uh, he's like, hey, man, you know, uh, you in the rat, you in the trouble, and all that. I said, man, I don't fuck with no kids. Do not fuck people up that fuck with kids. He's like, oh, well, don't worry. You're going to get plenty of opportunity to do that. <laughs> I was like, all right, whatever. And uh, he's like, hey, man, you, you need a banger? I was like, two ways? He's like, yeah, you're probably going to need one, man. All right. So, you know, and then uh, I stayed there, you know, through my a and for like five days, and then they put me in my housing unit. And it just so happened that the dude they put me in with is actually the unit rep for the white boys, for the independent white boys. And, uh, you know, good dude, man. Got life in 55. All on hearsay. All on people just <clears throat> talking. No, they didn't, no tangible nothing. You know, and they gave it, he took it to trial and they gave him man life in 55 years. And uh solid guy, man. Where and, where know, was he from? As soon as I move into unit with him, I tell him that, you know, I'm moving to sell with him. He was working Unicorn. He comes in and we get to rapping. And I told him, hey, man, look, you know, and uh I said, look, I'm a retired vice lord, but, you know, I'm I'm, I'm running independent white boy. And uh, he's like, that's cool. As long as, you know, everything's good. And I went and hollered at the vice lords that was in the unit and told them, hey, man, look, you know, I, I'm one of y'all, man. You know, I'm, I'm people, but I ain't on count. You know, if it was forced count, I would have, you know, at the time, that joint, they wouldn't force and count. But if they would have been, I mean, I would have had to get on count, you know. But they wasn't. And uh, I just... I ain't gonna lie, man. I, I did everything I could in my fucking power. I had some pending charges that they were saying were pending, but they had been resolved. And it took me nine months to get the fucking case manager to look at my shit, you know, constantly fucking just haggling them. Because I want to get the fuck out of there, man. I mean, I seen dudes get fucked off, bro. You know, I seen one dude rolling by on a stretcher. They hit the deuces and they bring him out of the unit. And this dude, man, his fucking... I, I don't know how this dude lived. Dude hit him with a, uh, he made a hammer with rocks in a net bag and a magazine. And had it rich wrapped up in a t-shirt, man, and he fucked that dude up. i never seen that before. They made a hammer out of yeah, rocks and a t-shirt? It was pretty slick, man. It was badass. Like, I seen probably three people get fucked up like that. Yep. Did, did you know the kid I interviewed the other day, Green Eyes? Was he in Terre Haute when you were there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know Green Eyes, man. Green Eyes used to work Rick, man. He was he'd been out there pushing that motherfucking lawnmower across the ball field all the time. 
Yeah, they, they thought I was crazy because I go out there and help them just for something to do, man. Yeah. I'm a busybody. I like from the time I get up in the morning to the time I go to bed, man. I'm going, you know, and I like to stay busy. And you know, in prison, you, there's only so much you can do, you know. So I go out there and volunteer, man. It'd be fucking snowing. I'd be out there shoveling snow with the yard crew. I work fucking facilities, you know. I work general maintenance. And I'm just out there doing it because I didn't want to be in the unit. I didn't want to be around the bullshit. That's because you're one of the old country white boys that like to work, man. I've seen plenty of you dudes. Yeah, you know, I I, I do. And yeah, I'm country with shit. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> Got to get it on, baby. It's all good, man. That's what's up. So, yes, sir. do you end up getting out of Terre Haute or no? Yeah, um, finally, my, my, my case manager, they reviewed my, they did my team review. Um, he got a hold of records. They still hadn't gotten cleared up, but he just said fucking called the, the place because um, I showed him all these letters I got from him saying that they was taken care of. He calls, verifies the charges are dropped. My points drop down out of USP. He says, I need two places. I was like, what? He said, give me two places where you want to go. I said, shit, wherever. I don't even care. He said, well, he said, if you want to go across the street, he said, I can probably get you there pretty quick. I said, fuck it. I said, they're in Oxford, you know, because I heard Oxford was sweet. They got good programs up there at the time. Had a big weight pile, and uh, man, they ended up sending me across the street to the FCI at Terre Haute, uh, the medium, and um, it's the old USP, and it's one of the one of the older. I think, if I'm not mistaken, one of the cops told me it was the first USP built without a wall. Like you had Atlanta, Lewisburg, you know, um, and them, and then Lompoc, they built it right after Terre Haute, but it's something that's just fucking 80 years old. You know, there's no AC. It's fucking hot. You got two fans. Um, you can get three or four, but the police get to tripping by the policy. You're supposed to have two. And some of them dudes, some of them cops was with the shit. Especially if somebody got to acting stupid. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and take. I'm gonna go through here, sell to sell, and take all the fans that are you know extra. I've seen that. Let me let me ask you a couple things. So, you leave to go to that FCI. Was it was it kind of like a relief? Was it like, damn, I'm out of here? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Absolutely. It was, man, when when they put me in, I couldn't wait to call my mom. I said, Mom, she said, what? This man, they put me in. I'm going to a medium. She said, well, when are you going? I said, hell, I don't know. I said, you know, it's got to go through the proper channels, Grand Prairie, the region, and all that bullshit. And uh, finally, um, I was at work one day, man, in, uh, in facilities, and uh, one of the guys came up and said, hey, man, your, your boss wants you. So, all right, so I go up to him and I said, what's going on? He said, hey, man, he said, are you good? I said, yeah, why? He goes, well, they want you back in the unit right now. For what? He said, I don't know. He said, but they want you right now in the unit. And I go back there, and uh, my officer, you know, my pod officer, he tells me, he says, hey, man, go ahead and pack your shit up. I said, for what? He said, you're leaving. I said, where am I going? He said, I don't know. You're rolling out on the chain. And I was like, all right. And then he come back a couple minutes later because my next door neighbor, he was uh, he was leaving as well. And there was uh, five of us that went um, to the FCI and they carried us in a van, you know, just because it held us right across the street. <clears throat> and I go over there and I'm just like, Ooh, you know, like I can fucking breathe a little bit. And then I get over there and, you know, it was it was chill. It was, uh, you know, they were probably taking over there as well. You know, you got some good convicts over there. Um, but, you know, they was with the shit, too. You get out of prison. How much time did you do? How much time in your life have you spent in prison? Well, you know what? I'll tell you this right now. I've done, and it's sad to say this, man. I'm 42 years old. I did three years in juvenile, okay? And then from 18 till now, I've done, uh, let's see, I did five straight in Tennessee and almost eight in the Fed, so almost we're going to say 13 years with all the 60 days in the county jail here, 30 days here, you know, two, three days here, a week, you know, waiting to get a bond hearing and shit like that. So you get out of prison, man. Do you think you had PTSD at all? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little thrown off, man. You know, there's times when, um, and sometimes I don't even want to leave the fucking house. You know, my anxiety gets to me. I, I get, there's times when I get around a crowd of people and, you know, I, I start freaking out. I always got to be close to the door or, or have my eye on the door. You know, I like to know what the fuck's going on around me. When I go in a restaurant, I always sit with my face to the door, you know. Um, 
hey, I do all the same stuff, bro. Sit with my face to the door. And, you know, people get too close to me. You know, they bump into me. I get fucking pissed. I'm like, hey, man, what the fuck's your problem? Excuse you. You know, and I'm like, damn, just calm down. I'm like, no, nah, man, you don't fucking, you don't bump into somebody without saying, excuse me. Not where I've been. So. <laughs> In fact, you normally like, oh, excuse me, sir. You know, and kind of before you even, you know, even get around the person. Can I come in? No. Oh, please. Because I'm going here to go, G. Damn. Sorry, my daughter's in here. It's all good. I'm not going to even cut that part out. I'm not, listen to me. I'm not cutting that part out because that's a part of what you're doing now. Hey, that's that, part. You know hey, that, that, that right there is what, it, it's what makes it all worthwhile, man. That's what all the shit I went through, you know, and, and even the days, you know, I, I still struggle with shit, man. I struggle every day. And, you know, uh, main thing is I ain't giving up, you know. Um, I just recently got a really good job. Um, I had a good job when I came home and uh, I had to go back and do a violation and uh, in May of this year. And I just came home again in November 17th, but I killed my paper. So I have no more, you know, no more nothing. Um, hey, hold on. Let me stop you, man. How's it feel to be a dad, man? Man, it, it's always felt great to be a dad. You know, um, when I was, I was 27 when I had my, my first kids, I had a set of twins. And I tell you what, I was scared to death then. And I mean, I was fucking like, damn, you know, that's 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 something to look down and be like, man, I'm responsible for this. You know, I'm responsible for your human life. I was responsible for two at once, you know. And uh, it was uh, because my old man wasn't around. I didn't, I didn't have no fucking no dad to teach me how to be a man, how to be a dad. What I thought was being a man was, you know, out here on some other shit, you know, not no real legitimate grown man shit, which is going to work, tucking your kids in, doing the homework, taking them to karate, you know, um, getting them in, in, involved in intramural sports, you know, shit like that, man. Fucking, that's what it's about. Let me, Mike, let, let me, let me tell you this, right? I fucking, I question myself, you know, am I doing the right thing? You know, the thing I have to remember is, um, I don't need to be, I'll be their friend later on in life. Right now, I just need to be their dad and establish some boundaries and, um, you know, routine, things of that nature. So. I Listen, I feel you on that because, you know, even like with my wife in the beginning, man, when she, I want, I felt like I wanted to have kids. And then I was like, man, maybe I'm not responsible enough, man. You know, and I felt like in my relationship with her before I went to prison, like I, I suffered, man, over, you know, her going on with her life and for many, many years, man, for eight, nine years, I couldn't get over it, man. It, it crushed me because she was the love of my life and I suffered. And then when she got pregnant, I was like, damn, man, maybe the same, maybe I'm not mentally okay to have kids, to be a dad right now. I wasn't, I felt like sometimes I wasn't in the right place. Right. I really man, felt that know, way, man. Mike. God, and, God said you was ready. You was ready. So Sometimes when but, but there was we a, don't even know or think that we can do something because we ain't been down that road and we all fear the unknown and we question it. You know, we second guess it. Am I, am I ready for this? Am I ready for it? And the guy gave you a child, man. You ready for it? So he gave me two. He gave me two boys, right? And I felt I like say, that's another thing. You got twins. You know, I got two sets of twins. So I felt like, damn, man. And then once I had them, bro, that first day for real, man. I heard people say, oh, it changes your life. And I really didn't feel that way, man. Like when she was pregnant. And, I, and then when she, when when we had the kids, I was like, wow, man. It really did change me, dude. I wake up at. We work shifts, me and her, you know, at night. I got to get up at three in the morning. I got to get up at six. I'm taking care of them, giving them bottles. And you know what, man? It, it's, it is a good feeling, man. I, lo I love every part of it, man. Absolutely. But I didn't think I was, I didn't think I was there, man. When she was pregnant at first, I was like, nah, man, I'm, I, I'm not, like you said, I was afraid, man. Like, man, I'm, I have to be responsible. I can't go back to jail now. I have to take care of these kids, man. I can't go back to jail, right? And it started to change me, man. It really did. And, and I'm glad that it did, you know? You know, you, you were asking about the PTSD and shit, man. And I'm going to tell you, um, I've been diagnosed with a couple different things. That's irrelevant. But I know in my heart of hearts, you know, that, yeah, it, it prison affected me in, in, a, in a fucking, in a, in a, it, it affected me in a way, you know, here, you know, um, The shit that we've been through, that you know, motherfuckers that's been in them violent situations, you know, them real volatile fucking uh, prisons. Don't get me wrong. 
every prison isn't like that. Some prisons are, you know, what we call camp. I, I just did my time at Greenville, my little, uh, my violation at FCI Greenville down in, you know, in Southern Illinois. And man, that, that's fucking Camp Hug a Thug, you know? It, you know, it's, it's Camp Kangaroo. It's, it's, it's a fucking kitty camp, you know? But they got fucking chomos walking the yard. Like they got their own car. They got a couple tables in the child hall and shit. And I'm just like, blinders on? November, <laughs> you know? But it, uh, it, it does fuck with you, you know, to just think back on some of the shit that you've encountered. Um, you know, I ain't gonna lie, man, when, 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 I, when I had to stab that dude before, you know, I, that motherfucker pulled that knife on me, I was scared, he scared the fuck out of me. What? I didn't even really realize I stabbed him until it done happened. You know, it just strictly out of instinct. It was fucking me or him. I mean, it was like, I, I felt like my life was gonna go. You know what I mean? Like, it scared the hell out of me. So let's... I'm gonna you know, get- and I, ain't, I ain't no punk or no bitch or nothing like that. You know, I'm not a decent sized guy, man. I'm 6'3", about 240, you know, I mean, I'm I'm decent size. I'm in decent shape, you know, so for something, you know, it, it, it affects you, you know. It does affect you. Listen, before we close the show, you know, listen, you've been through it, man. And, and you've done things, you've seen things, you've been places that, you know, some people just talk about that have never been there, you know. Yeah. Tonight... If you could give a message to a kid that's on the wrong path, he's got a single mother, he's grown up in a single mother household, he wants to be in the streets, he wants to, you know, right now, man, they ain't, they ain't, they ain't doing great financially. He don't have the best sneakers on and he don't have the best hat on, the fitted hat and all that. And he's getting ready to get on the wrong path. What message would you give him, man? Man, look, for these young guys coming up, man, they, uh, I would tell them, look, don't feed in, and it's easy for us to say because we finally we we matured and finally got there. But you know, when I was young, I didn't want to listen, and God, I wish I'd have listened. You know, my mom, my grandma, my aunties. You know, um, hell, even when I got older, you know, even relationships, women that I've had in my life. You know, if I'd have listened to them, but I'm thinking that I got it all figured out. You know, but if I could tell them, I say, listen, you know, they might not be the best sneakers right now. But let me tell you this, that better than the motherfucking sneakers that you're going to get out of commissary. You know what I mean? That you're going to have to, hey, mom, I ain't doing so well, hey, you know. And, and your friends, your homies, your buddies, trust me, them dudes going to fall smooth the fuck off. You know, that's like uh, even my family that I fuck with tough, you know. Only a couple of them really held it down when I was gone, you know, looked out and. And, and that's another thing, man. Being a grown man, you know how fucking hard it is and humbling it is. I've always been a go-getter to go get my own shit, you know. Um, to actually have to bring myself down to a level to have to get on that phone and say, hey, mom, can you send me $100? You know, I had a little bit of money, but it was gone in no time, you know. But the money's going to dry up. Your friends are going to fucking try to fuck your girl. You know, that's the first thing that's going to happen. Go steal your shit. And you end up with a fucking number beside your name, waiting on mail call, talking to your people for the shitty thing about the feds is you get 300, well, now it's 510 because of Corona, 510 minutes a month to talk to your people. If you got any kids, man, you can't do that. You can't be a dad, keep a relationship. I mean, you can do it, but it's very fucking strenuous. Like, I had to buy three pack numbers, you know? I had mine and I had two or three other pack numbers that I had to buy just to be able to, to, to conversate with people. But I would tell them, man, it's not worth it. Um, I pissed away any money I made in the streets, you know, and in the game. I pissed it away on trying to show up and show out, you know, trying to buy all this tangible shit that I don't even have no more. You know, I either lost it in the divorce, lost it to the feds, lost it to the game, you know. And we're not even going to talk about fucking bond money, attorney fees, court costs, you know, none of that shit. But the real financial part is with my skill set, the amount of money I could have fucking, I could have done retired by now just off the money I would have made had I not been in prison. You know what I mean? I want that to. It's it's sad to, to think that I went, I don't regret it because this made me who I am today and this gave me the appreciation for life that I got today. But if I could keep somebody from going down that path that I went down, 
it'd be cool, man, you know. And I know I can't reach everybody. You, you can't. But we, whoever we can touch and reach, man, if you that young dude out there listening tonight, man, or that young gal, and uh, you thinking about, you know, you at that fork in the road, man, hey, look, the right way, it ain't always the most fucking, uh, what, what, how you say that? Uh, might not be the most right, enjoyable. The right thing might not always be the most popular thing, but I guarantee you, man, it's worth it in the long run. You know, it's worth it to put in the work to live life honestly than it is to be a fuck up, you know? And, and don't get me wrong, it's hard work, man. It's, it's It was easy to fuck up and sin and, you know, to be out there in the streets using. It's hard work to, to, to keep a sober mind, take care of kids, pay bills, you know, go to work, you know, it, 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 it's life, it's, but it's work. But I guarantee you, man, it's fucking worth it. I sleep good at night. I don't got to worry about somebody kicking my fucking door in for, you know, I don't have to worry about my kids experiencing any of that shit. You know, my my youngest set of twins that I, that I, that I got, you know, they live with me. I got custody of them. They, uh, they've never seen me fucked up, intoxicated, just, you know, staggering drunk, slurring my words, you know, passed out. They've never seen that. And I'm grateful for that. You know what I mean? I don't want them to ever have to see that. I want them to see dad frustrated because he's trying to get through to them and they don't want to listen. And I want them to see dad going to work, dropping them off at school, picking them up from school, you know? What's the cheap? And, and, and I tell you what, man, these little shits, they ain't cheap. They ain't cheap at all, man. But hey, they worth every bit of it. Well, listen, man. I'm going to get ready to close the show and just let you know, man, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you sharing your story, your experiences, man. We hear your daughter in the background, and that's what's well, up, here, man. Go on. Go, on, jump on, go on, jump on here real quick. Say hi. <laughs> there she is. There's my baby girl. This is the baby, baby girl. <laughs> Hello. So, so, look, I'm going to close the show, man. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. Make sure you leave a comment. I'm sure Big Mike will get back at you. If you got anything you want to say to him, we appreciate you. With respect, until tomorrow we're out. Hey, hey, one other thing, real quick, Chad. Look, hey, hey, look, look, look let me let me plug my barbershop, man. You know, I, I got okay. out of started a barbershop uh, here at home, man. And you know, it's called Convict Cuts, man, because, um, hey, I'm I'm a convict at the end of the day, man. I cut hair, and I always said I was gonna open up a barbershop. I was either gonna call it Fades by Felons or Convict Cuts. Convict Cuts just kind of stuck, man. But you can check me out on Facebook, Convict Cuts. And uh, if you live in the greater Kansas City area or you're going to be in Kansas City, hit me up. Uh, I do booking. I book my appointments and stuff on there. And uh, to any of y'all out there, man, that's been through the struggle that we've been through, keep it popping positive, man. It's worth it. To the ones that ain't sure, do the right thing, man. I guarantee you'll love your life. That's what's up, man. Hey, I appreciate you having me on here. And everything that you're doing, man, I appreciate it. Your work, you know, you're doing good stuff, man. God going to continue to bless you like he did. Well, I hope so, man. Listen, man, you have a good night, you and your kids, man. I'm happy for you. If people are in your area, man, check you out on the haircut tip. With respect, we're out.